everyone! Welcome to Humanitarian Chronicles, where I highlight extraordinary people doing extraordinary things. I am Abby Lodmer, conscious comedian, health coach, life coach, and I'm here today with the amazing sage Rabbi Mordechai Finley. Rabbi Finley was raised in Southern California, grew up at the Compton Jewish Community Center and Temple Beth Shalom in Long Beach. He is the founding rabbi of Or HaTorah Synagogue in Mar Vista, a traditional progressive congregation that has been around since 1993. Rabbi Finley has his Doctor of Philosophy in Religion and Social Ethics from USC and is a practicing spiritual counselor, not to mention a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. You can only imagine why I wanted to feature Rabbi Finley on the show. Thank you, Rabbi Finley, so much for being here. I My so pleasure and honor to be here. Oh, thank you. Well, I wanted to talk to you today in the craziness of the world right now and all the time about wisdom and how, how can we get wisdom, how can we uh, cultivate wisdom within ourselves in the midst of so much chaos and so much... I think the opposite of wisdom. I don't even know what the word is, but maybe you can enlighten us. Okay. Well, first, uh, the term wisdom is one that's hard to define. Uh, in the Western philosophic tradition, it goes all the way back, uh, you know, at least to Socrates, Plato, and I'm sure very much earlier. And uh, no one's really been able to define it. Um, sometimes they, uh, they talk about wisdom as one of the virtues. For example, wisdom, prudence, temperance, and courage. Others say that it is the chief virtue, but at some point these words all tend to involve each other. So I'll give you my little base definition. It's not a complete definition. It's just the base definition from which we can begin. Yay. But for me, wisdom has two components. The first component is insight into oneself, other people, the human condition, life processes, individual couples, communities, nations, a sense of uh, what, what we're going through and why and where it's headed. Um, the second part of wisdom is what I call virtue. Now remember, in other traditions, uh, wisdom is part of virtue, but I see uh, wisdom as containing insight and virtue. What virtue means is, again, at the base level, the capacity to act on insight. Yes. Now, act in what way? If there's a moral question that you act righteously and with a moral moral stake. And if it's not an exactly moral question, then you're after, in general, human flourishing, whether it's yours, other people, and so forth. Now, not all questions of human flourishing are moral. So, for example, music, which leads to human flourishing, you could be moral and be a musician, and you could be a musician and not be moral. So there are non-moral dimensions and moral dimensions, but the larger scheme of all of it would be a human flourishing, a human well-being. So insight on one hand, virtue on the other, for the baseline definition of wisdom. I love that. That's so beautiful. You know, I mean, it's like you said, so many philosophers, yourself being one, uh, have spoken about that very thing. And how how do they cultivate it? How do most of these right. wise people Well, that's a great, that? a great question. You see, some actually doubt whether wisdom can be taught. Um, and, and this is, we're talking thousands of years ago. If you look in the book of Proverbs in the Bible, is, con is constantly advocating that the readers, and this probably actually comes from a school curriculum, in my opinion, the book of Proverbs, Yeah, that they're saying, please acquire wisdom, please master discernment to Luna and so forth. So the question is, can it, can it be acquired? Mm. So I think in general, yes. Um, it does not require great intelligence, but you need some intelligence. But the main thing it requires is goodwill and the will mm -hmm. to transform. Many people fail in acquiring wisdom because they just don't have the will to change, the will to grow, the courage to look inside, and to act on the, on the uh, information that they have to change their lives. So how does one teach wisdom? Well, the first thing is I want to share with you is that um, I'm not a psychologist. I've never been to any professional psychological school. Uh, my counseling practice is based on what I call spiritual psychology. Now, it's an ancient tradition, very well developed in modern times. But the basic insight of spiritual psychology is that we have a higher self. So you can look throughout Freud, Jung, and others. They, they kind of assume it, but they never talk about it. Even in uh, humanistic psychology, you'll never really find the term higher self uh, explicated. So what it means to become wise 
is you're able to get at what I call the ego self, the patterns of consciousness that come from our genetic background, our early childhood, everything until today, that more or less make us respond to the world in habitual, ritual ways. We assume we know the answer, we act on emotions and passions, and we don't think things through. Mm. Now, many people, first they have the opinion, and then they think it through to arrive at their own opinion. I see this over and over again. So people confuse rationalizing and justifying with actual thinking. Wow. So the first thing is you have to have access to a higher self. Yes. And the baseline of the higher self, I can describe it to you in the next little bit if you want. Yes, I'd But love if you to really understand how to think. contact the higher self, you can cultivate wisdom. Well, is that, would you, how, okay, so how do you do that? I know that okay. Wayne Dyer talks a lot about that. He even has a book called Everyday Wisdom. I mean, a lot of spiritual leaders and philosophers that I've studied, you, you included, on the pulpit, you are amazing, and the wisdom that you Thank share you. with us, I, I mean, I've been in your congregation, that's why I wanted to feature you here, the wisdom that you share every week at Shabbat services is mind-blowing, I'm, I'm mind-blown right now, well, thank you, um, but yeah, how do you arrive at that, is it okay. a meditative so it's, practice? Uh, it's very detailed work, but remember, uh, I oftentimes use martial arts metaphors when I teach wisdom. Love it. And here's the first thing. Wisdom is not an insight. So you can go to therapy and have an insight about yourself and come back a week later, and that's the very, very slow train to transformation. So wisdom takes training. A person who wants to become wise is like being a musician, a dancer, a martial artist. You need to train, 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 train. So a person mm -hmm. not willing to train, do daily work, they may get somewhere just by aging and, and having perspective. Now, aged people are not necessarily wise. They just have a greater opportunity to be wise mm -hmm. because they lived through many years and lived through their mistakes and tried to learn from their mistakes. We're going to talk proactively. The first thing a wise person can do is cultivate what I call observer mind. Get out of the emotions. Get out of your biases. Get out of your assumptions. Get out of your opinions and ask yourself, what exactly is going on around me? What's happening inside of me? What's happening inside of you? What's happening in the situation? So observer mind is you withdraw yourself out of your opinions and your judgments. Not that they're wrong. They may be completely right. But step out of them just for a moment where you can see yourself as one of many. Mm. So whatever your politics are. So many people start their politics with they're wrong, I'm right. As opposed to, wait a minute. Maybe they have some right and I have some wrong. Who knows? Let me step above myself. Observe what's happening inside myself before I make a judgment. So observer mind is step one of cultivating wisdom. Okay. The next step of cultivating wisdom is what's called objective mind. They're a little bit different. Because with objective mind, you truly want to understand the position of other people. Mm. Now, this can be in interpersonal relationships. It can be in communities and even in politics. This one thing that distresses me is people have such uh, hard, sometimes rigid political opinions, left, right, and center. And I say to them, have you ever spoken to somebody at length, not argued, spoken, discussed, with someone who differs from you? Mm -hmm. You'd be astonished how many people have never actually sat down and talked with a person who politically differs from you. Wow. That's one thing is just can you be objective just for a little bit and understand the point of view of the other person without agreeing with it, but that you can present it where they would say, yeah, that's exactly what I think. So mm -hmm. sometimes when I counsel uh, couples, for example, it's been a lot of work in couples counseling where one, one person will say, well, here's what I think. And I'll say, uh, well, do you understand what they think? They say, yeah, but here's where they're wrong. I said, no, wait a minute. <laughs> do you understand what they're saying? They say, yes. I said, could you articulate what they just said? And they can't. Mm -hmm. So I say to person A, would you please explain your position again? No drama, no accusation, no blaming, just what your position is. I'll turn to person B. Can you repeat what they just said? Abby, you would not believe how many people cannot repeat what other people say. Unbelievable. Well, I would believe because we right. see what we want to see and we hear what we want to hear and it's through our own filter that we hear things. That's exactly right. So one part wow. of wisdom is you can disable that filter as much as possible. So we have observer mind, objective mind. The next one, this comes out of, very much out of uh, the Greek philosophic tradition, the Jewish tradition, many other traditions, is what I would call rational mind. 
Now, rational mind is really interesting. This, we're getting a little bit deeper here. For everything that we do, think, feel, there's a theory. There's a reason. Now, many people resist that because the theories, reasons, are not conscious. Right. So I'll give you an example. I have a parent haranguing a child about homework. And I say, what's your theory? They go, what do you mean what's my theory? You know, I have to work, they have to work. I say, well, that's a theory. You have to work, so they have to work. That's, mm -hmm. that's a theory. Now tell me what the difference is between your work and their work. And they say, well, what do you mean? I said, describe to me your work. They said, well, I work hard. I don't like it very much, but I make good money. I said, now ask them about their work. They've never asked their child what it feels like to do their work. Wow. Because all they do is tell them what to do. So they go to the kid. Instead of saying, did you do your homework? They can say, how do you feel about your homework? What's it like doing that homework? And the kids say, it's meaningless. It's drudgery. I'm not interested in it. I'll never use this in my life. I wish I did your work. I wish I went to work every day and did what you do. That would, I would love to do that. This is meaningless. You actually make a difference in the world. You buy, sell, trade. You know, people come away happy from a deal. I'm just doing stuff that no, no one even cares about. Wow. So, what, so part of what objectivity is, uh, uh, rationality is, understand your theory. So objectively speaking, you and your kid have a point of view. And you're, here's a, a typical parental theory. I work, therefore they have to work. I say, okay, so give them a job. Right. Exactly. I say, okay, no, 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 no. My real theory is if they do well in school, they'll do well in life. I'll say, can we actually try to verify if that's true? There's right. no, I mean, there is maybe a little bit of evidence for it, but how many kids do you and I know did well in school end up in rehab centers? Amen. Amen. And, and, yeah, ended up miserable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they All did. the way through school and ended up miserable. They did well in school because they were snorting Ritalin. That was keeping them on path. Then when they right. became addicted to Ritalin and it didn't work anymore and went to cocaine, that was another story. You're snorting Ritalin to get through school and then you become a drug addict. No, I know, <laughs> I know so Boy. many cases. Well, that's so interesting that you bring up the school topic because I work with kids in a lot of capacities and I hear that same thing. I'm a tutor. So I hear that very argument or that very thought process feeling from kids all the time. And, and I feel it too. Why aren't we learning about interpersonal relationships? Why are we learning Precisely. about isosceles triangles? What If this kid's not going to be a mathematician, why is he learning about an isosceles triangle when we could be learning about how to love ourselves more, how to love each other, how to, like you were saying, um, just get along in the world, like be that's an observer. That's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, in terms of wisdom, like what if the parent does get that answer? Would the wise parent say, wait a minute, we need to tackle this school thing in a different way? Like, I guess that would be another step of wisdom is the application of it. Correct. Which, that's, that's where virtue comes in. Yeah, See, okay. Wisdom is the insight to what's going on, Love and it. virtue is the capacity to act righteously on the insight. Love that. So when you see your kid is burnt out, trying to get A's and so forth, and what I, what I try to tell parents is, there's the wisdom that I call parenting the soul of the child. Hmm. I say, here's, in my opinion, here's what you want out of a kid. First of all, is the kid safe? Does your child know how to be safe? And if they're burdened in school and they're burning out, they're not going to be safe. Wow. Boys especially will do dangerous things because there's so much going on inside. Is your kid moral? Meaning, are they going to hurt other people? Mm. The third thing, uh, is your kid respectful? A respectful person goes further in life than a disrespectful person. Every kid has to learn it eventually. Why not learn it in the home? Love it. The fourth thing, is your kid thoughtful, rational? Can they reason through a problem? Fifth, is a child insightful? And I could add many more, um, but getting their homework done is nowhere on my list. Wow. Wow. I love this. Mordecai Finley for school board president, for, <laughs> for, for government school leader, district no, leader. You. I. It's so true. I think about these things all the time. I'm faced with them every single day, just kids that are not engaged, don't care. And then there are the kids who are respectful to parents that are not their own parents and mm -hmm. res and respectful to teachers, even if they're not going to do their homework because they hate it and they Correct. think it's pointless. They're respectful to teachers, but they're not respectful to parents. We're getting off the, the wisdom topic. No, no, this is, this is just, exactly right. 
And therefore, when the, when the parent says, my child's not respectful, I say, how are they in school? Well, they're very popular in school. The teacher likes them. I said, you understand you have a problem with your child. It's you and your child. It's not your kid. Don't wow. say my child's not respectful. Say my kid doesn't respect me. Wow. Now, notice how important it is to define a problem carefully. It's another part of theory and rationality is using words correctly. So I always find, except in cases where there's some kind of, uh, you know, a n- neurotic problem or disorder or something, that disrespectful kids do not feel respected. Wow. Almost always. That is... The parents will say, I don't care how you feel, just get that homework done. And I don't care about that, just do this other thing. Well, the kid feels unseen, disrespected. So the kid, 13, 14, sometimes 11, 12, starts to disrespect the parent. The parent starts to argue with the kids. So, for example, the wisdom of parenting is put the homework aside, put the cleanliness of the room aside. We'll talk about all of that. First, is your child safe, moral, uh, respectful, rational, insightful? And then other things, loving when you can get it, industrious, creative. I have a long list of things. But for most parents, the wisdom of parenting is parenting the soul of the child, not raising a child to, to uh, check boxes on the checklist of uh, extrinsic, uh, uh, you know, extrinsic values, oh, but rather yes. things that are more intrinsic. Oh my gosh, this is such wis- this is such wisdom. I wish I had this for so many of my students, and I'm glad that I'll have it for my future children. So thank you. I am sure. preserving this video forever. That's why I'm doing these okay. interviews for me. It's right. selfish. Okay, good. Um, where good. can a parent read about this stuff, or do you have online courses about it? How well, can uh, a parent learn about this? This video for sure. But is there are there books that you love, or courses? Yeah, there are or? books that I love, and. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, with the demands of being a synagogue rabbi and a professor at a seminary, is I just haven't had really had the time to organize my material. I mean, I, I am trying to get a book done, and hopefully I'll have it done soon. But the kind of books you want to look at are um, books that um, that focus on what I call the, the parent or adult-centered home. Yes. Okay. Now, I'll give you an analogy that I read in a book. That when you go into a classroom, the children are busy figuring out, ideally, what the teacher wants. they got to figure the teacher out. Mm-hmm. The kid comes home, and it's a child-centered home, which will make a child neurotic and morally ill. The kid should be trying to figure out what the parent wants, like in the classroom. So the parent-centered home is that there's an adult order in the home. I call it like a coat of arms. We're, we honor each other, we respect each other, we're industrious, you know, we're a team, not always wondering about the kid. So, um, you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, I had a teacher who had trouble with a kid in the Hebrew school, and I saw the teacher talking to the kid. I said, what's up? She says, I'm trying to find out why he's misbehaving. I said, let me handle it for you. I sat the kid down, I said, you have 30 seconds to decide whether you want to be in this Hebrew school or not. I'll give you 30 seconds. Wow. Because if you do, you got to figure out how to behave. And if you don't want to be here, just leave. Don't get in my teacher's way. My teachers are paid to teach, not to deal with, with misbehaving children. Wow. So make a decision. I said, I'll wait. So he says, okay, I want to be here. I said, great. Do you know how to behave or not? Do you behave in, in public school, in, you know, in, your, in your regular school? Yes. So you know how to behave. You want to stay here. So what is the problem? Kid says, well, uh, I'm bored. I say, that's your theory? You're bored, so you get to make a teacher's life hell and ruin the experience for their children. Is this your theory? Where else do you do this? When you're bored, you get to ruin everybody else's lives. And suddenly the kid realizes he, he's being morally shallow. Now, I don't care why he does it. Now, if there's something deep going on at home, I'll find out. But a lot of kids misbehave because we're so focused on why are you doing this as opposed to, hey, there's a standard here, step up. And sometimes when you address a child as an adult, like, I got a job to do here, don't get in the way of my job. Especially with boys. I say, you know, your parents are, t- are paying me to teach. You're getting in my way. Right? So I got to do my job here. You're going to get in my way or not? Wow. And boys go, yeah, hey, okay, Rabbi. 
you know. And we kind of like a, have a guy guy agreement, you know. Don't get in my way. I'll make it easier for you as you can. Just don't get in my way. Kids go, yeah, okay, good. So it's an adult centered environment, not a child environment. Now there, there is compassion, there is care, but first there's a standard. There's wow. a standard. Rabbi, that is so beautiful. And you are living that virtue of wisdom by doing that. It is so important. I see so many child-centered homes, and they are wrecks. And you are absolutely right. It's a moral dilemma. I think more rabbis and leaders need to be in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Yeah. I, <laughs> seriously. Well, that's very much the thing. Oh, my gosh. I mean, the, the coddling and spoiling and what can I do? What's wrong? Like deep therapy, psychological analysis. No, how about we just start with basic respect? How about you just understand that it's an adult-centered Hebrew school, school, home, mm -hmm. and you abide by our guidelines. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like, yeah. And, there, and therefore, so for example, in the home, uh, if my kid doesn't want to do their homework, now, I can't say that we have a, a, a purist approach, but in general, I say, your grades are your grades. That's your school, that's your teacher. I say, what I want here is uh, safe, moral, respectful, rational, insightful, and then other stuff. I said, if you, if you don't want to do well in school, don't do well in school. It's not my school. And all of a sudden, it's no longer between me and my kid. Yeah. Between my kid and the teacher. Now, what many kids do is they use school in order to combat their parents. Mm -hmm. When the parent says, I don't care, it's your school. All of a sudden, that reason for arguing is taken away. And the kid says, what, really? Yeah, really. It's your school. The kid does better or does the same but doesn't fight with the parent. You know, every time I challenge parents to do this, I say, tell the kid, I don't care what grades you make. The parent says, well, what if he gets a D? I said, are we, ta are we talking seriously here? Because you're going to catastrophize. I said, why don't you just try and tell me what happens next? So the kids always fake it for a week, and they don't turn in homework for, for like a week. And the parent says, I don't care. It's not my homework. And you know what drives the kids? The, uh, the respect of their fellow classmates. Are they the kid that doesn't do homework in time? Uh, are they the kid that fails publicly? So all of a sudden, instead of what I call an exoskeleton, which is the parental uh, helicoptering, you have actually an inner spine. So parents who, who, who govern their kids, they're like giving an exoskeleton, and when the kid goes off to college, it's gone. But parents who uh, cultivate a child, they have to grow their own spine, right? They have, a, you know, they have a, their, own, their own vertebra that they're caring for. They are resilient, stronger. And also, uh, Abby, they have to face their own demons. Yes. Right? So if they're going to procrastinate, it's not the parent's job to yell at them and shout at them and make deals with them. They got to face that demon themselves. Yes. So what I say to parents is let your kids face their demons when they're 13, 14, not when they move out when they're 18, 19. Yeah. Face the demons early. Oh, I am so in agreement with that. Rabbi Finley, you are, have hit the nail on the head. I am so in agreement with this Good. wisdom. Thank you. With this wisdom that you are spouting. Oh yeah. my gosh. I am playing this video for every parent I know. Listen okay, up. so this, this is the theory part. This is the theory. Observer of mine, my kids having trouble, objectively speaking. I wonder what they're going through. Theory, it's their work. My job is that they're safe, moral, respectful, rational, insightful, etc. That's, that's my job. No one's going to do my job. The teacher's not going to do it. The teacher's too busy getting a curriculum across. I'm the only parent they have, or, the, or a set of parents. Let the school do the school. I'll do the parenting. Wow. How, oh my God, I mean, this is just my question about everything in life. It's like, how do I become that parent? Because it seems like so many parents I know do the overprotective helicopter parenting. They want their kids to succeed in school because it's a reflection of them, and they don't want to see their kids fail. Either. That's exactly right. That's <sighs> exactly right. Um, so it very much is, when I, when I quiz the parent on their theory, it almost always comes down to this. I can't let my child fail. And I say, what makes you think your kid's going to fail? Right. What it comes down to is fear and lack of belief in the child. Wow. So they have to do, make sure everything gets done, lest the child fail. And I say, what if you had trust in your child and you believed in your child, instead of trying to uh, manage their life for them, man help them manage their inner life and let them do what they got to do. So you start saying, I, so for example, 
the worst thing on this topic is when your kid comes home is how much homework do you have? Never ask that question. Say, um, how are you treated today? How did the teachers treat you? How did you treat other people? What's going on with your friends? What's going on with your boyfriend, your girlfriend? What about that thing with that teacher? And they're waiting for you to say, how much is your homework? Then maybe at the end you can say, do you need any help organizing your day or some homework? If not, you're good. Wow. And that way the kid doesn't have to lie. Oh Kids lie because they're ashamed. So why shame your kid? This is so profound. This is, this Thanks. is the guidebook right here. This is the guide video. I'm like, what books can we read? What videos can we watch? This one. Oh okay. my gosh. This is so... Yeah, you know, I, I might do that. I might, you know, I've done eight-hour lectures on, uh, I've done, like, seminars, like, from nine to three, and, and uh, you know, maybe I'll take a look at them and just try to put them online. There, We have them in the archives somewhere, so maybe I'll do that. that Thank amazing. you for your, uh, for your vote, of, uh, vote of encouragement. Oh, well, Rabbi, I work with these kids every day. It's, you know, I'm a comedian, I'm a life coach, I'm a health coach, I've got the show, and to make money, I'm a dog walker and a tutor and other things, too. <laughs> You know, we, we creatives, sure. we creatives. Um, it'll all solidify soon. But yeah, I see it every single day in my practice. I see this very thing. And of course, I don't have kids yet myself, so I'm constantly taking notes, <laughs> thinking, what can I read? Who can I talk to? What videos can I watch now to be a better role model for these kids, to be a better um, tutor? I don't, and everything you're saying reminds me very much of 12 Steps too, which I love. Like, do not enable, let, mm -hmm. let them hit bottom themselves because only from there can we rebuild a strong foundation. That's exactly right. Yeah. All yeah. that. There is a, this is a very stoic virtue approach. I love which it. Which is our job is to teach them resilience, insight, etc. Let them solve their problems once we give them the tools as opposed to more or less uh, manage their hands while they're trying to fix stuff. You know, show them how to use the tools, give them the diagram. And let them fail. Damn. So a lot of it is parental fear. All of it. <laughs> that's, that's the background. Here. All of it. Well, I mean, and of course what I'm thinking is, and you're right, I think you're absolutely right. When parents start actually inquiring how the kid feels about their day, how were they treated, how was your interaction with your teacher and your classmates, I think that kid will start thinking, oh, my parents care about me. Not about my achievements, not about my successes and my performance, about me. So I think that will develop a stronger backbone and yep. it will develop a kid who actually wants to succeed on her own. That's I really, exactly right. I mean, it, it sounds so logical to me. Mm -hmm. um, though, like, what if there's a kid who is failing except for the help of his parents and tutors and, like, it's the writings on the wall. I mean, obviously, the only thing to do is try it because it ha if it hasn't been tried. Yeah, uh, but... I haven't had it yet. What, what I have had is a kid who says, uh, I want to quit school and become a professional snow snowboard. <laughs> and her parent says, okay, I'll emancipate you. I'm not paying for it. <laughs> awesome. Yes. Do whatever you want. Awesome. So the kid says, really? Yeah, you know, you're, you're finishing your sophomore year. You're going to be 16. I'll emancipate you, move up to Mammoth, and make your own way. Wow. Right? It's like, I'll call your bluff. Yeah. Because oh. says, no, I want you to pay for it. Parents I'm not paying for it. Sorry. Do whatever you want. Wow. Okay. And, and the kid backs down. So see what happened is the kids, I'm blaming my parents because I am a natural champion snowboarder and my parents won't let me. So the parents come to me and say, what should we do? I said, let him go. Let him face it. But he has to pay his own way. Oh, my God. Parents, parents said, I'm not in your way. You do whatever you want. As long as you're safe, moral, respectful, rational, insightful, industrious, you do whatever you want, man. Forced the kid back down. Couldn't blame the parents anymore. Wow. Wow. This is good. These are gems. Gems of <laughs> wisdom. Parenting gems. Who knew that this yeah. would take this, this turn? It needed to, though. I need to. Everyone needs to know this. People who work with kids, work with other people. All of this is good guidance for even working with other people. Because like you yeah. said before, which I love, just because you age doesn't mean you gain wisdom. You mm -hmm. can be the most immature, older person. I, I see I, him all the time. I, yeah, me too. I mean, yeah. I'm, I think I am one half the time. 
when I <laughs> when I when I don't Thomas. learn. <laughs> I mean, not as an offense to myself, but sometimes I I see the way that like you were talking about that I live from emotions and I live from in reaction to instead of from an empowered place, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I've been alive for forty years. What have I learned? Have I done yeah. my teshuva? Have I done my tikkun? Because I'm still reacting and I'm still living from that lower self. Well, place. I'll, I'll share with you that the daily training, um, the first daily training is what I call the wall of virtue. Now, you may not need this, but just in case, this is for everybody. Please. The wall of virtue is, I say to myself every morning, I will not criticize anybody. I will not complain about anybody to themselves. And in general, I won't complain. In general, maybe I'll vent a little bit here and there, but I don't want to cultivate a complaining brain. No criticizing, no complaining to a person, and minimal complaining anyway. Mm -hmm. No condemning, no accusing, blaming, labeling, comparing, etc. No insulting, obviously. No contemptuous looks, contemptuous gestures. And if you do, you apologize immediately. No, there's no excuse. Mm -hmm. The fourth thing is what I say is minimal conflict. Being on any issue, once there's been three go-arounds, stop. It's not going to get better. So that's the first thing. I will, and behind it, of course, is I will not express hot anger, nor be passive aggressive. So no expressing anger, don't be passive aggressive, no criticizing, complaining, condemning, minimal, uh, uh, minimal conflict. That's the floor. That's the base. Now people say to me, oh, what, I can't have anger? I said, I never said you can't have anger. I said, don't express anger. You can have it, but you don't have any right to make another person miserable because of how you feel. Yes. So whatever you're feeling, say, well, whatever I'm feeling, no anger, hot anger. You can be upset for a minute. Um, no passive aggressive, no criticizing, complaining, condemning, or admittable conflict. That being said, say anything you want. Wow. That is amazing. Do you have that written out somewhere? Where's that? Yeah, mantra? I've written in many of my, in my, my, if you, uh, um, you know, I think I posted it on my website, although I'm very behind in that. Maybe my Jewish journal blog. If you take Rabbi Finley criticizing, uh, complaining, it'll pop up. Somewhere. Okay. Yeah, I'm I have, gonna I have find little, it. three, three, four hundred words on this. Oh my gosh. But, but the, the, the next thing, uh, Abby is once I have my wall of virtue set up, I have to ask myself what I actually want from myself and other people, a measurable behavior, mm -hmm. a measurable behavior, not I want to be uh, um, more productive or I want more love from my spouse. It's way better to have a measurable behavior with a time stamp on it and a beginning, middle and end. So I say more productive is that between 2 and 3 o'clock today, I will do the following. Right. That's manageable. Mm -hmm. More productive is, is, is too big. Right. It doesn't include a behavior. So, so many people don't grow because they don't actually set out either for themselves or interpersonally a specific behavior. Here, so here's what I say to people. Um, I call it the mill. Grind it down to a specific behavior. That's number one. What you want. Compose the, the, the ask in as few words as possible. Make sure that your motivations are clean and your goals are clear. Make sure your timing is good. Mm -hmm. um, make sure there's no insult or complaining involved. Just, a, just ask for the thing. Make sure you ask the person permission to talk. So, for example... My wife and I say to each other, may I have a moment of your time? Beautiful. You always say, may I have a moment of your time? When I'm in the store, when I'm in the grocery store, the hardware store, I walk up to the person, I say, may I have a moment of your time? Because what it does is it clears their head of their distractions. They look at me and they say, yes, now we're talking. When you just blurt something out to somebody, sometimes it startles them. Sometimes they don't like it. So I say, may I have a moment of your time? Yes. And then here's what I want. So for example, let's say... Uh, um, I leave coffee cups all around the house. Okay. So my wife says, hey, can I have a moment of your time? Sure. First, the police report. I notice coffee cups around the house because you've got to have buy-in because I might say, no, there are no coffee cups around the house. So first you got to get buy-in, the police report. 
Right. <laughs> I noticed there are coffee cups around, yes. Um, I'm inferring that you've left them. True. <laughs> I'd like you to clean up your coffee cups. Okay. Got it. Within the next hour. <laughs> you understand? That's the best. That's the best example I've ever heard. That's it. Because if she comes and says, I can't believe you leave your coffee cups around, then I'll say, well, I can't believe you, and it just escalates. Wow, it's so true. Have but you, you just come say, yeah, you just, you, 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 I call it the mill. you got to grind it down. So I'm going to give you an example that you would you really like. So this couple is fighting bitterly, almost separating. they got three kids. They've been married for 10 years. The kids are like three, five, and eight. She's taking care of them all week. And she says, on the weekend, my husband helps out. He says, no, I work all week. On the weekend, I get to relax. And so, you know, he goes down to his man cave and he's on his uh, computer. And she says, comes and says, you know what? Blah, 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 blah. You know, here I am, da, 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 and you don't, da, 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 and escalates. And he goes, well, you know what? And they have this fight. I said, what do you want him to do? I want him to help more. I said, give me a behavior. I want to feel I have a partner. I said, can you tell me what you want him to do? Mm-hmm. She said, ah, oh, um, it's a good question, Rabbi. I said, give him something because he doesn't know what you're talking about. You're just going to ask it. She said, okay. I want him to do the dishes. I said, by when? By noon on Saturday. I said, so you tell him, honey, I'd like you to do the dishes by noon. If you don't do it by noon, I assume that's a no. And I can take no for an answer. Stop talking. She said, well, what if he says no? I said, well, then you go do the dishes. She says, why should I? I said, because you don't want to fight. Because fighting will kill your marriage. That's why you're, that's why you're in front of me. Wow. Right? You don't want to do the single mom thing. He doesn't want to do the visiting dad thing. I guarantee it's not going to be worth the dishes. Mm-hmm. Wow. Just go and say, hey, can I have a minute of your time? Sure. I like the dishes done by noon. And if they're not done by noon, I'll take that as a no. And I can take no for an answer. And she says, well, what do I do next? I said, you'll know what to do. Because he has fundamentally disrespected you. It's no longer a fight. It's much deeper. It's no longer a fight. She says to me, I get a text. She we rehearse. takes a half an hour to rehearse. Because she says, come, she says, um, I want you to do the dishes. I said, change your tone. There's no fight yet. It's just an ask. So she told me she did it by the numbers. Honey, can I have a of your time? He says, sure. Come to the she says, I'd like you to do the dishes by noon. If I don't get it by noon, I'll take that as a no. And I can take no for an answer. Because what he used to says, yeah, and then he would procrastinate it all day because he wanted to have a fight with her. Whoa. He's conflict driven. Okay. And he looked at her and said, um, I'll do it right now. And she said, I, I don't understand why he did it. She said, because he saw in your face, you're not into the escalation, you're not into the fight, and you're asking something kind of existential, which is, are you going to help me or not? Uh, are you going to help me or not? And what he saw in the future is, we're not going to the movies tonight. We're not having sex tonight. We're not hanging out tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If you can't give me this one little thing I'm asking for, he can see the writing on the wall. Wow. So sometimes when you grind it down to simple, could you please do the following? By this time, I can take no for an answer, your move. Wow. It's so calm and real. That most of the time, you'll get a yes. And if you get a no, say, all right, I can take no for an answer. You got to think about it. What's going on? The next day, you may say, hey, can I just, you know, I thought I asked you something small. Can I have a minute of your time? Sure. Uh, did I not ask you to do the following? Yes. And you said, no, correct? Yes. I'm so curious as to why. I'm not saying you have to. I'm not ordering you. I just, I'm really curious as to what your reasoning is. And sometimes you'll hear things you never expected to hear. Wow. This is... So this whole idea of calming yourself down, using few words, communicating what you want, taking no for an answer, wait a day and find out what the deeper thing is. is. When couples master this wisdom, this is what I call the base wisdom of uh, interpersonal relationships, then you can build on it. 
Because what happens in interpersonal relationships is once all the noisy conflict is out of the way, either you're either you're you're getting your need met or you're not. But it's not worth it's not worth the relationship typically until it is. Then you can get to the deeper thing. One and number two, the mystery comes back. The beauty comes back. Right. So I'll give you one example, and then I'll let you ask me questions. So oh, I'm coaching you're answering all my questions. Oh, okay. Go on. I'm, I'm coaching a woman to do this. And as I'm coaching her, she realizes, I really pick on my husband. Why do you do this, and how come you do it that way, and why don't you do it this way? And I said, that's why he's going into a shell. I said, just observe him for a day and don't say a word. She said, okay. She said, oh my God, what a curious man. What an interesting, quirky guy. And she just hadn't looked at him. She says, oh my God, he doesn't need me harassing him all day long. He's a separate person. Mm -hmm. She got it. Got it. That is so beautiful. It is. It really is. It is yeah. so beautiful. When you say it, it seems like the most logical, practical, doable thing. Yeah. No, yeah. When this we're is where in the, theory, it, the theory, the theory of relationship comes in. Right. And then when I'm in it and I'm at the height of my frustration, which I guess comes back to the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Al-Anon, 12 steps, meditation, prayer, however we get there, daily practice, mm -hmm. like you were talking about. It's the daily, has, has daily to be a daily practice. practice, or else I yeah. just am too in it, and I can't see beyond my anger or emotions or old programming, and then mm -hmm. I do not create a happy home, because... There you go. So when you start with, I will not express hot anger... I will not be passive aggressive. I will not criticize, complain, condemn, or engage in conflict. I will keep all that stuff behind my wall of virtue. Whatever I want, I will grind it through the mill and just ask as simply as possible, something measurable. And I can take no for an answer. People who try that, the relationships get amazingly better within within 30 days. Oh my God. It takes 30 days. Yeah. Like any habit. Like that's, anything. That's why rehab is 28 days. 21 yeah. days minimum takes there, takes three weeks. That's exactly to, right. Something to happens to the brain. So, yeah. Because you could say to somebody, um, could we leave at 8 o'clock? And they'll say, you're always criticizing me because they're hearing you from a month ago. Yes. Oh, my gosh. They, no, I just want to know if we can leave at 8 o'clock. Why are you always bugging me? Um, okay, actually, I just need a yes or no. You can say no. I'd like to leave by 8. You can say yes or no. Takes four or five times. Person goes, oh, so what you're asking me is we can leave by eight? Yeah. Uh, no. Okay. Walk away. What you're doing is you're changing the hologram in their head that they have of you. Wow. I see. For for the first thirty days, you don't want them to do anything except change the hologram that they have in their head of you. That is deep. That it is really is so deep. We, we have holograms of each other. We don't. We I don't really see a person. If I have any background, any uh, you know, any history, I see the hologram, not the person. Wow, that is so true. Okay, I'm I'm on board. I'm on board. You have inspired me to the depths, Rabbi Finley. You have inspired okay. me. I am on board. I am going to change the holograms I have of all the people in my life. I mean, I'm willing to. I, I don't want to make any promises that I can't keep. <laughs> Do the daily practice and take care of itself. You know when I began Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? I was 45 years old. Wow. I, I was 50 pounds overweight. I could barely get through one session. And uh, we have what's called the Ralph's Club. All beginners, especially if they're out of shape, they wrestle and then they go out and throw up outside on the curb. We call it the Ralph Club. Okay? Because, <laughs> you know, Ralphing means to throw up. Right, right. right. <laughs> so he says, look, you show up. Here's what my trainer said to me. You show up, I'll take care of the rest. Wow. You show up an hour, hour, you know, three times a week for an hour, I'll take care of the rest. That is so inspiring. So just train. I showed up on the mat. It took me 15 years to get my black belt. You don't look like you're older than 45. I was thinking, well, how did he get his black belt this year? <laughs> That's I got I my black thinking. belt when I was 60 years old, and I'm in better shape at 62 than I was when I was 45. Oh my gosh, mazel tov. You're because so Because I show amazing. up to the mat two to three times a week. Doesn't matter. So same thing with the daily practice. You do the daily practice. All you got to do is show up. The daily practice does the work. Yep. 
That is beautiful. All right, That's well, the um, like 12 steps. Just keep showing up. Well, I am going to Google Rabbi Mordechai Finley, M-O-R-D-E-C-A-I, F-I-N-L-E-Y. Looks Irish, sound, sounds Irish. He's a Jewish rabbi, folks. Okay. I'm going to Google Rabbi Mordechai Finley. Um, what were the keywords? Uh, no criticism. Criticizing, complaining, condemning, conflict. All the four C's. Criticizing, the complaining, C's. condemning, conflict. Google that. I'm Googling that, and then I will put it in the description under this video. Okay. So that we can And I have all... stuff on my Facebook page, and I have little intros. So you go to my – it's on my personal page. I try to put it over to my professional page. But if you go to my page, um, a lot of this stuff is, uh, is already up, and I'll organize it soon. Yay. <laughs> hey, if it's already on Facebook, it's already organized in my book. That's our okay. that's our main uh, stream these days, Rabbi. Yeah. You're on. Yeah. You're more organized than you know. You're okay. so Good. thank you. You're so amazing. I'm I'm just so grateful. I cannot wait. Sure. I'm going to post that wisdom beneath this video so we can all okay. have that beautiful intention set for the day and have our moral virtuous barrier yeah. between the wall of virtue. Right. The, the wall of virtue. Right. The wall of virtue every day, ladies and gentlemen. Let's all do it as a community, as a human community. The wall of virtue. Let's build it so that we can become virtuous and loving in our daily interactions from the hardware store to the market to the school to the pulpit. Let's yeah. build the wall of virtue. Let's get wise because it's daily Absolutely. practice that builds wisdom. From what I've learned from you today in this session, I feel like I've I feel like I've had a session. I I, I need to pay you for this counseling session. I'm so grateful. Seriously, you just keep doing what you're doing. Oh That's, my gosh, you're 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 wonderful. You're delightful, and your enthusiasm and your will to for transformation for yourself and others is palpable. So it's a it's a delight and honor being here with you. Oh, thank you, Rabbi. Thank you for seeing me. You spot it. You got it. Thank you. Okay. Amen. Well, how can we okay. find you and how can people work with you if they're not in the Los Angeles area, if they want to transform their lives and gain deeper well, wisdom? Well, tune in on, on Facebook. I broadcast live. Great. Uh, every Saturday morning, twice, 9.15 and 11.15. Yay. I broadcast my uh, weekly, I call it my Wisdom Works class, every Wednesday at 12.30 to 1.30. Broadcast live. Home to the public. Yay. And um, so anybody who wants to study with me, just tune in. That's amazing. Open the public. That's so amazing. Okay, so we can find you on Facebook. Hmm? Mordecai Finley. Yeah. Okay. Everybody, Rabbi Mordecai Finley or just Mordecai? My personal page is Mordecai.Finley, I think. Okay. And then my rabbi page is Rabbi Mordecai Finley. Awesome. I'm, I'm trying to remember to move my talks from my personal over to my professional page. Okay. Well, but you, it's there. Yeah. It's not... We can Google you, and I will you put I will put all that stuff on the bottom of the video as well. Please do, do. and a, some of it gets up to YouTube, by the way. So if you type Rabbi Mordecai Finley YouTube, I, it, it is the Shabbat stuff is on YouTube. Yay! Okay, well we'll find you. You're findable. Okay. We will hunt okay. and find. I'm findable. And I'm findable. Do you have any last words of wisdom for our viewers? Um, and re unless there's really a severe disorder, you can make things better with other people. You really can. You can be a better citizen by coming at things with wisdom and virtue and not adding to the noise and the anger and the hostility so we can be an agent for change in ourselves, in our personal relationships, in our communities, and our nation. So that's my, that's my vision for this work. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing your part to make this world a better place, Rabbi. You are thank truly you. a humanitarian that I needed to chronicle. So thank okay. you for being here. Thank you. You are extraordinary. Everybody go check out doc Dr. Uh, Rabbi uh, Finley. Rabbi Doctor. Yeah. Rabbi, Rabbi Doctor. Rabbi. That's right. Rabbi Doctor, however you want to put it. Are you an American? Are you a Jew? Are you a doctor? Are you a rabbi? <laughs> what the, comes The rabbi first? is the most important part. Oh, that is so beautiful. He is definitely a teacher. Rabbi Mordechai Finley, a teacher among teachers, an inspiration among inspirations. Check out his uh, On the Pulpit every Saturday morning at Or HaTorah's Friday nights too. And no Fridays. No Friday nights, Saturday mornings only. I remember that. And yep. Wednesday Wisdom Days. 12, wisdom works at 12.30 on Wednesdays. Win wisdom works at 12.30 on Wednesdays. And that's online, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I broadcast it on Facebook. I'll put, I'll put everything down. Thank you so Great. much, Rabbi. You. you are an inspiration. You are a light unto the nations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Tune okay, in have, next a, have a good rest of the day. You bye too. Bye. Take care. Thank you.